Hey there class, Professor Steve here. Um, and for this mini capture, um, <clears throat> basically before we can uh, go over the, the many complex uh, workings of the ocean, uh, we need to have sort of some uh, a basic understanding of of the different parts of the ocean, how we how, how the oceans are distributed and what are some of the important features and the way we define um, ocean zones. Um, and 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 so in order to move on, we'll 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 go over some of that here. Um, so essentially, the oceans cover most of the planet. And what I mean by that is um, the surface of the ocean. So the surface, if you look at the complete cover of this of the ocean of the uh, Earth, rather, um, seventy one percent of it is covered by ocean, and and only twenty nine percent of it is is land. And it, and it can be um, a little disillusioning when you look at um, a spherical map on, on a flat presentation, uh, a 2D presentation like we're doing here. But when we break down uh, all the, so, so that's in terms of total surface of the Earth, 71% ocean, 29% land cover, so, so we do tend to call the Earth, an Earth a water planet. Um, but if we look at the total for that water, so if we take all the water on land, all the water in the oceans, and add it up and, and break it up into a percentages, um, out of all the water on Earth, 97%, so just about all of it, is salt water. So either the oceans or the seas that we that, that we designate. Um, if you take that remaining 3%, so the non-salty water, approximately 1% of it only, so 1% of all water on Earth is, is fresh water that's accessible to us. Um, what we call drinking or potable water, um, and and the remaining two percent is inaccessible, and most of that two percent is tied up in ice, so the polar ice caps. So if we break it down by section, we look um, sort of longitudinally, which means lines going this way on the map. Uh, if we look at what what we might call, it from our perspective, the the um, the Pacific Ocean, right? So the the, the, the ocean that stretches between the continental U.S.'s western border and, and Europe and Australia's eastern borders is the Pacific Ocean, and you can see in these, this representation shows quite well that the Pacific is by far the largest chunk of ocean, salt water, right, what we call our oceans. The Atlantic is sort of is the second biggest, um, and so they take up the majority uh, of our oceans. Um, and then a little bit in here, um, which wraps over basically into here, um, is the Indian Ocean being the second biggest. If we look poleward, and we look at the South Pole, here's Antarctica, which is ice-covered land, um, but you see that it's completely surrounded by water. Antarctica is the only small chunk of land in the pole, and, and there's a lot of water in what we call the Southern Ocean. We'll take a quick different look at this on a, on a flat map in a minute. Um, but when we look at the North Pole, we have oceans and seas up here, um, and, but even though the, the, the Ar the Arctic is only ice, and there's no land under it. Um, there still is a lot of land mass, that a lot of continent that wraps up into the northern area. So there's much less ocean um, when we look uh, the North Pole versus the South Pole. So how do we how do we divvy these up? Uh, where are they located? Most of you should be relatively um, uh, familiar with this, right? So our our largest portion of ocean, the Pacific. Um, the second largest portion of ocean, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, the next biggest, and so what are the last two, right? We d basically um, uh, divide the ocean up into five separate major oceans. Uh, number three, actually, on that list, on my list, anyway, is the Arctic, so that's that stretch that has a lot of land interjected into it when we look at it from the North Pole. And this is this long stretch when we look at the South Pole that wraps around the Antarctic. And again, it's kind of deceiving when we look at things spread out on on a big flat two-dimensional map like this, right? But this is how we spread out this 71% of ocean. All right? if you look at numbers, uh, the Pacific is 55%, the Atlantic 25%, the Indian 17% <coughs> of all our oceans, and then the remaining three of all, so we're just talking about only the salt water now, only the ocean seawater, the remaining three is all other waters. So this little sliver is the um, Arctic Ocean, the Southern Ocean, um, and all the seas that are, that are designated as being uh, separate. 
Um, but what it is important to realize is that it is one large interconnected ocean. Even though we ha we separate it um, for geographical reasons, r reasons this really is separate into. It, I mean, really is one large interconnected ocean. So that that's kind of the big picture here. And this the, the next couple slides are just to give you an idea of how we break down some of some of the other smaller portions uh, of that little three percent. Um, and the majority of that is broken down into seas, many of which we're probably familiar with, but there are a lot of them. If you look at a large scale like this, we have um, number one, here's the South China Sea. Um, it's a pretty a relatively familiar one, but even more familiar is the Caribbean Sea over here, um, the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, which is almost landlocked, but that's, this, is, this is quite familiar as well. Um, as being part of border between uh, Africa, Europe, and, and the Middle East. Um, the Bering Sea is a, is a very important one and is a well-studied one in the northern Pacific uh, off the coast of, of, of Alaska, right off the Gulf of Alaska. Um, the Gulf of Mexico, right? This is a, another distinction from the oceans, but but it, but is actually interconnected. But but it's it's a sea, but we but but the uh, the land masses around it designated as a Gulf. Um, the Arabian Sea, uh, which is another another important and familiar one, and it's kind of an inlet into the into the Middle East. Uh, the Sea of Akask, which is um, which is a very cold northern European uh, sea. And a whole bunch of others. The Sea of Japan, uh, the Hudson Bay is a very large and well-studied, uh, mostly landlocked, but still saltwater um, water mass north north uh, northeastern Canada. And then we have um, East China Sea, the Adamant Sea, some smaller things. The Black Sea is a famous one. That one is is for the most part landlocked. Um, in the Red Sea as well, and those two are, are very, very salty because they don't have this as open a, an exchange um, with the open ocean, and they get very little fresh water input in the, in the form of rain there. And if we zoom in, if we zoom into these little sections in here that I haven't even covered, um, we start to break up these sections of ocean into even small, in, into even more seas. So here's Greenland, you know, uh, Russia, Finland, Norway, United Kingdom, and Ireland down here. Um, but if we zoom in, we have Greenland Sea, Barents Sea, Norwegian, Norwegian Sea, North Sea, Baltic Sea, um, and and no matter which group or, or which, which place you decide to zoom in, especially along the continents, we, we break much of them down in similar ways. So just want you to be aware of that. Uh, much more importantly, you know, how do we divide the ocean itself, um, both lengthwise and with depth? Um, into what we call the ocean zones. Okay, so th these these distinctions will become very important throughout the class. Um, so this is this picture is a is a depiction of a cross section of ocean, right? So so this is land over here, right? So this is getting onto the continents, onto land, um, and this is following the sea floor from from west to east basically and what we have is a is a slope away from the continents until we reach a relatively flat but still deepening section we would call the shelf um, uh, then we have another slope basically as the as the, the shelf descends into what we would call what makes up the most of the ocean which is the deepest flat spots and that's an abyssal plain but but um but what we're looking at is a west to east cross section of ocean. Okay, so the two ways that we can break them up. Actually, there's three depicted here. Um, um, but the first is uh, with distance from land. Okay, so if we just look across the across the surface of the ocean, these sections of ocean as we get away from land. Over here is land. This section in here that does not have a bracket we would call coastal. Right, so this is near the coast. Um, very near the coast we call intertidal or literal and intertidal just um, depicts the, uh, the the idea that this is the section of ocean that is influenced very heavily by the tides right the high tide um, the water is high there low tide the water is low there and that that affects that area and that transition very well once we get out over the continental shelf here so this bracket covers everything from the edge of the slope to the end of the continental shelf, we call that neuritic. So it's not coastal, but it's still nearer to shore, neuritic part of the ocean. This whole section of ocean is neuritic. 
everything from the shelf on out into the open ocean, and that's the key term, open ocean, we call pelagic. You can just just um, associate the word pelagic with open ocean. So this, all of this ocean out beyond the neuritic, out beyond the continental shelf, we call open ocean or pelagic. So if we mention a pelagic species or a pelagic event, we're talking about anywhere in the open ocean. <laughs> The other two ways, um, one listed this way or here, one listed here, are, are essentially zoning the ocean, dividing the ocean up with depth. Um, whenever you see the term photic, so if we take this photic out of here, that, that, that essentially uh, should shout out light to you. So this is breaking up the depths of the ocean with light. Um, and they pretty much align with the other way, which is basically uh, breaking the ocean up into depth. Right, so epi meaning basically surface or on top of and pelagic meaning open ocean so the epipelagic ocean is essentially the surface of the open ocean meso means middle so this is sort of the middle depth of the open ocean bathy um, you could basically ass um, assume that that means bottom so the bottom of the open ocean um, and the epipelagic can, is, is essentially usually defined by uh, by the light that penetrates from the the sun's light that can penetrate how deep it penetrates and so it ranges you know anywhere from zero to, to 200 meters usually I think the average is around 50 50 to 100 but in some places it's as deep as 200 anywhere between um, the bottom of the epipelagic and about a thousand meters we call it mesopelagic and meso means middle so this is the middle section anywhere below the a thousand meters we call the bottom part of the ocean this is by far the largest sec the largest volume of ocean if you add up the bathypelagic that that is the majority of ocean and it certainly is almost all the ocean if you add the mesopelagic and bathyl together the very very deepest parts of the ocean <clears throat> So these are in, uh, a small percentage of the ocean, but it's the deepest parts because they're found in trenches, um, we call hadal pelagic. So these are deep, absolutely no light, the very deepest reaches. Now these terms over here are just ways of, 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 of associating these depths with light. Euphotic means anywhere that the sunlight can penetrate down to a certain percentage, and that percentage happens to be one. So up here you get tons of sunlight. Down here you only get 1% of the sunlight. And then dysphotic essentially means... Uh, basically um, without light but but there is still some light that penetrates and then aphotic really means no light even though there some people say that that some still does penetrate definitely the hadal pelagic no light whatsoever so what about that sea floor here's the sea floor I show nice smoothy smooth curves and lines and flat spots but when we look at the sea floor so all these red yellows and oranges are continent all these dark blues are all the blues are our sea floor we see that you know these ridges in the in red um, and 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 green and orange depict topography so mountain ranges and plains and when we look at the the same the same features in the ocean in blue we see that it's not much different than on land we have mountain ranges we have trenches we have plains um, and so the the sea floor is very very dynamic right the, if you look at a at a at a cartoon of the of a of the ocean basin cross section um, this is what I'm talking about we have the shelf we have the slope we have the rise um, essentially this is this is a section of what I just showed you in the other cartoon um, but it's much more complex than that we can have these uh, volcanic mountains that form structures in the middle we can have places where they separate in the in it, um, where, where where there's some volcanic activity that actually separates away from each other those are called mid-ocean ridges these things can build up to be very large and then be weathered down and we get a form like this like a seamount and then we have other parts of uh, most of this is all formed by tectonic activity, right? So we'll go over that in real detail in the next lesson. And then we have these really deep parts, again, formed by the way tectonic activity happens in our, uh, uh, around the uh, entire crust of our Earth um, that can form these very deep trenches. And then, and then, so we can see over here we have sort of a shallow type of coast. Over here we have a very deep sort of coast. Um, and this is just an intro to this, and we're going to go over sort of this in much more detail in the next lesson. Okay, thanks for joining me. See you next lesson.